Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Francisco Pineda with uh, Solidar Adult School, and I'm, I'm also an OTAN um, subject matter expert. Okay. I am very, very happy that I have, we have about 200, over 200 attendees, making it one of the biggest webinars that I have done, and I'm very, very excited. And we're in for um, quite a roller coaster right now, I could say, with we know that we're doing distance learning, or we're at least trying to do uh, distance learning. So it does been a, um, a lot of us are using Zoom, some other agencies are using other platforms, but today I'm going to be focusing on using Zoom in the adult ed uh, classroom. So once again, uh, Francisco Pinedo, Solid Ed Adult School and OTAN subject matter expert. Our presentation title is Using Zoom as a Distance Learning Tool in Adult Education. Let me go into my... Um, So the objective for today is to inspire you to use Zoom with your students. Uh, also to guide you from the setup of a Zoom account to hosting your first Zoom meeting. And also a good way to connect with your students is using Zoom. So I will be talking about how we use Zoom here at Soledad Adult School and how I use it personally as well with my um, students. I uh, do want to start with a little bit of a disclaimer is that, for example, here in Soledad, we only use the basic Zoom uh, account. So you could log in to your, uh, create an account, which I'm going to guide you on how to do. Uh, but with our free limited account, uh, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that if your district, if you're using your district Zoom account, you might have. So that's something to consider is that we're using the quote unquote free account, but right now uh, it is unlimited time because of what we're going through. Uh, I also want to say that using extra features like polls, breakout rooms, confuses many students. I have tried it twice with my students and it does cause a little bit of confusion uh, for them. So I just want to throw that out there as well. And most students access Zoom via a smartphone. So their landscape is very small. So we're presenting, or at least I'm presenting on a nice uh, 16 inch uh, computer, uh, my laptop. But we have to remember that many students, their landscape might be a mobile device and they're not going to be able to see everything that we're gonna be sharing or the polls or the breakout room. So it does make it a little bit harder. So we have to, take that into consideration as well. So the agenda for the next hour or so is we're going to be covering how to sign up for an account, a free account, how to schedule a meeting, how to set up a meeting, test trying a meeting, which is very, very important. I'll tell you why later. Uh, inviting students to a meeting and what to do or what things you could do during your meeting. So the first thing you want to do is you want to set up a free account. So you would go to www.zoom.us. And once you go onto the page, on the upper right hand corner, there is a orange button that says sign up, it's free. So you would click right there, you could uh, click on it. And then from there, you would follow the instructions to set up your account. I do suggest you use your work email to get unlimited meeting time. Uh, a colleague of mine, she um, used a, well, I asked her to set up an account using her personal, uh, personal account and it was only limiting her for 40 minutes. This was two weeks ago. Things might have changed. With Zoom, things tend to change on a daily basis. So uh, you would go in to sign up. It's free. You would click on it. Again, it's on the upper right-hand corner of your screen. There is an orange square, nice, uh, with white letters that says sign up, it's free. So once you do that, you would, again, follow the instructions, and they're very basic. Again, it's your email, your name, your agency name, uh, basic information like that. So once you set up your free account, you're going to want to schedule a meeting. Okay? So what you would do is, again, you would go back into your zoom account okay uh, and then on the 
upper right hand corner on the upper right hand corner you do have on the very far right you have your if you upload a picture of yourself it's in a little round circle or you might see just your initial and then there are three of it not the first one the second one but the third one from right to left is going to say schedule a meeting and that is where you are going to be scheduling your meeting so once you have your free account you're going to click on schedule a meeting and then right there you will set up the meeting you would have the information for example your personal meeting id your address that you're going to use to share to your students and then it has it says what type of account you have notice mine says uh, i have the basic and i could upgrade uh, so in that case, because I'm using, I created it with my own, you could see that I, I'm using my, my actual uh, school account. And then this is the link right here that you see right under that says personal meeting ID. That is main, most of the, the times I use the same meeting room. Might not be the best practice. I'll explain why a little bit later. Uh, but this is the one that I would share out with my students and they would have access to. Okay. I'm um, seeing in the question, it says, is this account set up the same process if your school district have developed? Uh, that I wouldn't be able to answer because I'm using my account in my district. Each of us has our own account. We don't have a district account. The district does have an account, but they only use it for them. Uh, us teachers, we don't have access to it. So I'm, um, I'll look into it. Definitely look into it. You could, um, you could, uh, email me, I'll put my email address at the afterwards and then we could um, exchange the information. Uh, yeah, I, it's, I won't be able to enlarge because it's a screenshot of the screen when I was setting it up. So if I do that, it's gonna, um, I'm doing the presentation, so I won't be able to enlarge things, so. And Francisco, I'm gonna jump in here real okay. quick. This is Melinda, everybody. Um, if you go to your view options, you can also increase the magnification or the size of the screen that you're looking at. So that may help as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Melinda. And the question, who gives the personal ID? The personal ID is generated in Zoom. So they, they do all that. Okay, so when you're scheduling a meeting, the topic, so you want to name the meeting. So in Solid that Adult School, we run, there's days when we run four, upwards of four, maybe even five meetings. So you want to make the meeting the title of the meeting. That way also when you send it out to the students, they're going to see this as well. So I usually name it whatever the name of my class is. So for example, I would put Francisco Pinedo's uh, digital uh, class, uh, basic computer class or, or basic or computer literacy. And then the description, I would add information. This is a Zoom meeting for our computer class that meets on Tuesday. That way the student knows, because some of our students are in two to three to four different Zoom meetings, depending what subject. And then you also want to do the when. You want to set the date and set the time and set the duration. I have found that about an hour worth of instruction is pretty good after an hour i mine did go two hours last week after about the hour and 15 minute mark you know people were a little bit antsy they were a little bit um restless and you started noticing because we were the first time we we're doing video um so i i would say about an hour and then that way you know you'll be able to deliver your instruction and it will you know, it will be easier. Uh, you'll be able to stay more focused. Time zone, very, very important. By default, it's the Pacific time zone, but you'd be surprised. The first time I created, I had set up my meeting and it was on Eastern time. So <laughs> that's a big difference. Uh, meeting ID, you could uh, do it generate automatically or you could use your personal ID. I tend to generate it automatically. That way, every time there's a different ID meeting, we've heard a lot about people Zoom bombing what they call uh, classes. Uh, so this way, every time the new meeting ID is, um, is generated. Uh, password. 
that's up to you. I have tried it with password and for some of the students, it has been a little bit of a barrier because they confused the meeting ID number with the password. So uh, if they are clicking on the link from a mobile device, I believe the link already has the password. So it's just a one click. Uh, but for many students who are accessing it on a computer, they would have to put in the meeting ID and the password. So I have tried it with both. I have found it more successful if I unclick require a password. But again, that is up to your personal uh, preference. The first time I did, it was okay. Uh, the second time I did, I was able to get in everybody on time and, and get everything um, up and running. So what I have a question here is, uh, I am using the Zoom basic account. So that's the free account, nothing of the business pro or, or anything. So it's just your typical basic account that in other times would only give you 40, 40 minutes of, of instruction. Uh, how do you say you can set reoccurring meetings if you see right here if you're going to have the meeting Let's say every Tuesday at 6 p.m. for an hour would put reoccurring meeting But with our schedule sometimes especially our students work schedule right now is the beginning of the work season So some of our students are actually getting out of work 630 So we always ask the week before what would be a good time? to set up the meeting is six o'clock okay, 6.37. So that's why I don't do a reoccurring meeting because it would set it up by default on that same, uh, the same time. But if you are set, I'd like to say set it in stone, then you could do a reoccurring meeting, okay? Uh, when you are in the video part, whoops, went ahead. Uh, you do, it's up to you if as soon as you connect, you wanna have your uh, video shown like it, for me in my case at the beginning. The participants, I like to, the first time around, I let everybody on video because it was the first time we were gonna see each other after about three weeks, two or three weeks. But now I'm to the point where I don't wanna have, I don't wanna have everybody's video on at the same time because of bandwidth issues and then because of distractions. <laughs> uh, some of the students were getting a little bit distracted because the student was here and the TV was flashing on the background and you had, you know, all this other activity going on. And then audio, my free account only lets me use the computer audio. So by default, it's on both already. Um, and Alisa says that for security reasons, Zoom is requiring a password. Yes, it does. But again, you have the option to control it if you want a password or if you don't. Okay, so I'm looking at some of the questions before I continue. Okay, let's see here. Uh, you do need a password, it's a new rules. I tried it yesterday and I still was able to do that option where the students didn't. Uh, can the students see this in Spanish? I do not know. I, I only do it in English. I have no um, knowledge if it could be doing um, in, in Spanish. Okay. Uh, can my students use their cell phone for Zoom? Yes, they can use their cell phone uh, for Zoom. They definitely can, and that's one in uh, the slide that's coming up. Okay. So once you set up your meeting, you click on the meeting tab, which is going to be on your left-hand side and the, towards the first top. And then right there, you're gonna have your information. You could add it to your Google Calendar, and then notice this one, I did require a password, so it does have the little check mark. Uh, if I wasn't to check, uh, select the password, it wouldn't have the check mark. And then I have the, the URL here. Notice that it says copy the invitation. This is where we would copy the invitation and send it to all the students via the Remind app. We use Remind. Uh, you might use a different way of communicating with your students. So whatever you use to send text messages to your students, that's how you would use it. We do use Remind. And um, so that's how they would sell. So when they would get it, they would get a meeting invitation, very similar to the one you got when you registered for this uh, workshop, for this webinar. And it's gonna have the information, the presenter, the, the date, the name of the meeting. Notice for this one, I, I named it my meeting test meeting because I always like to run a test meeting beforehand. And then I would send out this information. I would click on this, uh, this one here, it's towards the bottom 
right hand corner it says copy the the invitation link so that's what i would i would do so now you set up your account you set up your first zoom meeting i've invited the students now it's the actual first meeting first zoom meeting or my first virtual class as i call it so for the first time as you could see in the picture that is illustrated here with different images of my students i have several students and you could see they're at home uh, some of them are in their bedroom, some of them are in a quiet place. So this one I would allow the first time it will be a way where we reconnect with each other. I feel it's very important to, especially right now, to connect with other people and see how they're doing. And I would give them maybe about the first 15, 20 minutes. We kind of talk how, how we're doing, how we're feeling and uh, things like that. It's just a good, I just find it as good therapy for myself and also my students did as well. And then once I do that, I start doing the intro to Zoom. So I start telling them how, what is Zoom. So I tell them it's a way where we conduct meetings and, and then we also do basic functions of Zoom like the chat feature. So then because most of them are on a device and I did see somebody at the top say they couldn't see the chat box because they're using a tablet. So each participant screen would see a box that has unmute, start video, share content, participant, and then there's three little dots. I know in, in um, Google, I believe they're called the hamburger button. So you would press on that one, and then with that, you would see the option that pops up at the top. It says chat, claim host. You don't want to claim host. Uh, so I always just tell them, click on the chat, the very first one, and then that way it would give them access to the chat screen. So notice that their chat screen is very different maybe from if you're on a computer, you have it to the side. On their phone, what happens when they open up a chat box is that they're not going to see your screen that you're sharing, but they're only going to see the chat box because we have to remember landscape, working on a big computer, they're on a small device. So we have to remind students to uh, make sure that once they chat something that they click close on the upper left hand corner to click close and then that will return them back to their um to the main screen that is participating okay let me look at some of the questions how do you get the invite from the desktop to remind you copy and paste so i would copy it and i would paste it into remind um, or I would copy it and email it to myself. You know, there, you, you would just do a copy and paste uh, for that one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, there's a question from Stephanie. I wasn't able to send an invitation link that was highlighted for the last meeting I set up. The link was just plain text. That is one thing that I'm hearing a lot about doing copying and pasting because of privacy issues, things like that. So you might just copy and paste and then have the student do the same thing, copy the link and paste it into their browser. I know there's a lot of extra steps, but we don't want to compromise people's security, especially if they're accessing a mobile device that has their information, bank accounts, credit cards, things like that. So there is gonna be sometimes extra layers of security, but again, it's for our student security and it's also for our security. So that might be a, um, a, a workaround there. Uh, how do I print out the chat box? I don't think you can print out the chat box, only if you do, uh, for example, uh, screenshots. I mean, I, I've never done that I'm, uh, for, for Neil. I'm sorry, I've never done that. So, but one way you could possibly do it, and I know you can do it, is if you do a, um, a screen capture, you take a picture of your screen from your computer. If it's on a Mac, it's Control Command 4 on a PC. I don't know what it is because I work only with Max. So, um, so you would be able to, to do that. So remind students to send chats to everyone, just like Melinda said at the beginning of the session. Right here in the image that I have of the chat screen that's under on your upper right-hand corner, notice that it says send to, and by default it says everyone. But once in a while, if you, somebody chatted, it's going to have that person's name. So you're actually sending your chat instead of to anyone, you're sending it to um, just that one person. And if it's something you wanted to share with the group, 
you're only sharing it with one person and not, not everyone. So um, it's always good to have a helper to monitor the chats. Uh, and for that monitor person, I let them open their mic so they can read the questions. For example, when I do webinars, it's my, um, my ESL instructor, Mrs. Fausto Araceli, uh, Vanessa. And then I also work with Araceli as well. Uh, so with Ms. Vanessa, she's the one who's answering the questions. And when she's teaching the class, I'm kind of the monitor and I'm reading the questions and answering the questions. So it's always good to have, if you could have one person, excuse me, it could be a, another instructor or it could be a student or someone you have at home, okay? So, and with chatting, it's also encouraged students to chat. It's a good way to assess their soft skills. If you pose a question, you're seeing how they're responding. So again, I always tie that up with the soft skills. Be like, well, if you're responding to your supervisor at work, what is the appropriate way to respond to a question? Okay, uh, let me see some of the other questions I have. Um, all right, uh, let's see, how do you customize settings to select specific days on reoccurring meetings? So when you select specific days with your calendar, let me just backtrack a little bit on that one, because that's an important one. Here, when you do reoccurring meeting, when you hit that one, then right there, you could customize the dates. So it's kind of like your Google Calendar when you set up an event and you want it reoccurring you could select the dates on it. So that one, you would actually have to go into your account, click on the reoccurring and then customize it. So it won't do it for you. You have to manually select the dates that you're gonna do, the times. Do remember sometimes holidays, sometimes, for example, right now it's spring break. So I wouldn't have nothing set up with my students this week, or at least for me, because it is spring break. So, but if I do set a default, like I did at the beginning of the semester, they would get the calendar invite uh, or the remind for today, they will log in, no one's there. Then they're texting, hey, what's going on? So do customize it with uh, knowing like holidays are coming up. For example, uh, the next one coming up is Memorial Day. So you might not wanna have it set by default to that Monday, to every Monday at a certain time. Uh, most, as I mentioned before, most students do access Zoom on a mobile device. So the image that you are seeing now is what I would see on my uh, cell phone. So do consider how much you plan to show and show knowing that most students have a screen size no larger than six and a half inches. That's like your bigger end phone. So on, I do have a screenshot of what the students are seeing on a phone. So they're seeing this presentation, usually covering the first top half of their screen. And then the bottom half of their screen, they're seeing the buttons. Of course, if they do the landscape mode, they'll be able to see the full screen of my content, but they won't be able to see the unmute, start video, share. Well, they, you don't want to have them share content, but the little hamburger buttons that I mean, that's how they call them in Google. So that's how I'm calling them. It's the three little dots that say more. They won't be able to see that one. I do want them to see that one for features like chatting and things like that. Okay. So let me see. Okay. And here I'm going to show examples how at Solid Dad Adult School we use. Uh, Zoom. So we use it for our ESL classes. We also use it for our high set classes. I use it for my computer literacy class. And um, so this is our examples of how they use it. In this one here, uh, Mrs. Vanessa Fausto is the instructor. So she is sharing her screen. For example, here the, the activity was write the words from simple present to simple past tense. And then here you have the students. So they're actually doing the instruction together. So for this one here, um, for, for this one here, Ms. Fausto would say the word and then the students would write it down in their notebook and then she would uh, call on a student. For example, in this case, uh, she would call, let's say Francisco. And then she would ask the student to unmute or she could unmute the student and ask them directly, for example, Francisco, what is the past tense of play? And spell it for me. And then Francisco will respond, played. And Mrs. Fausto would say, spell it. And then Francisco would say, P L 
A Y E D. And then Mrs. Fausto here would be able to annotate it and put in the answer. So everybody is seen. Okay. So there's different ways of doing it on the right side of the screen. I do see um, this was from Mrs. Araceli Fausto's high set class. She's teaching her students how to simplify uh, fractions. So you could see that here she has the problems she's working with and she is going step by step on how to solve the problem. So there's different ways uh, with the ESL students. It's sometimes easier uh, you know, to annotate your answer. When you're doing math, it's a little bit harder to do, but Mrs. Fausto is wonderful. So she finds a way on how to do it. A uh, couple other questions. Since most of students speak Spanish, how much Spanish do you speak during your online session? And what is the, uh, what situations do you speak Spanish? Okay. Because we are still in English as a second class or an ELL class, we do encourage the use of English. So we give our instruction in English uh, for the high set example that is on the screen. Uh, the instructor, it is Mrs. Fausto does teach Spanish high set. So she does teach in Spanish for the ESL. It's mainly English. The Spanish part, we use it mainly for connecting housekeeping rules, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on how to send them on, on, um, on Remind. Uh, I'm sorry, on Zoom. So that's when, when it would be. Um, so if you don't have an assistant or what happens if you have no one that is suitable for an assistant, well, then you kind of are doing what I'm doing where I'm, well, you know, in, in this situation, I'm looking at the questions, looking at the screen and so forth. So you can do it. It's just going to be a little bit harder. So that would be a, a workaround. Okay. Uh, the first meeting, as I said, this is with my computer literacy class. I have everybody's video open that wants to share. We just talk to each other. How are you doing? How have you been? And then I go over the ground rules and things like that. And then after that, I kind of don't um, allow video because, again, of bandwidth issues. Um, when you're having a meeting, there are different features that you can do that you can't do on a webinar. So what we're doing is a webinar uh, in a meeting, which is if you create your own personal free account, you will be doing a Zoom meeting or a class, as I say. You can transfer files from your computer to the student. So you would select the chat feature, okay? And then in the chat feature, when it opens up, you're going to select the file and then send it to the participants. Whoops, wrong screen, I'm sorry. So it's actually on this screen here. You would click on chat and then your chat box would open and then you're going to see, it's going to say file. So you click on file and then from there, you would select the file that you wanna to transfer to your student. I do caution because once you send a file, it's gonna prompt the student to open it. So they're not gonna no longer see your screen. They're gonna see the document that was opened up. So to get them back into Zoom, they might tap something, they might disconnect. So I try to discourage that by sending the information beforehand, uh, whether it's a file transfer in Remind, I send them the document, or for my computer class, I have Google Classroom. Um, whichever way you, you could send it prior to the session, would be a little bit helpful because again, if your student is working on a mobile device and they tap on something, it might throw them off completely and then they'll get lost and then they'll be calling or texting. How do I go back in? <coughs> so, excuse me. So then you, would, you wouldn't want, want that situation. But again, if it's on a computer, if you're working on a computer, that's a, a good way to do it. How do you get the split screen? I'm not too sure, Linda, what you mean by a split screen. Francisco, I'm going to pop in here because yes. we've had several questions kind of okay. related to that. On a previous slide, you showed uh, Mrs. Fausto, I think, mm -hmm. um, and she was typing the answers into a worksheet. Yes. Right here. So could you actually share that worksheet yes. with her while, and she was typing it and you were in the Zoom meeting, but she was in the Zoom meeting too, but she had the worksheet open. So had, people aren't quite wrapping their head around that. Okay, so 
to be able to do the screen annotation and share it with the students? Yes. Okay. I would have to, um, let me, give me one second. Let me see if I could, I would do, okay. If I get this We've thrown them a bit of a curveball, folks. So <laughs> patience, please. Okay. So, are you seeing my my Google calendar? Yes. My Google. Okay. Perfect. So, what I do for when we do screen annotations is the teacher uploads the content into the drive. So, you can see this is my person, my school um, Zoom drive, and I'm going to use um, this material that's developed by teacher Jennifer, who I see who's in the classroom from Milpitas Adult School for Citizenship. So I'm going to open up the document. So my student might have this document digitally, or if, um, if it's a book, sometimes the students, uh, you know, they, they buy the, the workbook and they're able to do that. So on this one here, so let me just backtrack. So I, I upload the PDF into my Google Drive, and then I'm sharing my screen. I click on the PDF. And then here where it says open with, I tap on open with, and I click on the very first one that says doc hub PDF sign and edit. So I click right there and then this little thing happens. Again, this is a quite of a big document, so it might take a little bit of time. Okay, so pretend you have the beautiful document right there. And now you could annotate by using, I would do just the text annotation. So there we go. So then first, what we would do in, in the sample lesson is, uh, for example, this one here is for citizenship, is the interview three, the, fifth, the 15 of the N400 questions. So we have vocabulary. So first, as the instructor, I would review the vocabulary. Claim, divorce, law. And then here, I have the pictures that will match with, with the vocabulary. So for example, this one here is, that I would ask the student, for example, I would say, okay, uh, I would name the name of the student, I would unmute them, and then I would ask the student, what word would go here? And then the student would say single. So then I would click right here on the text, I would move the text where I want it, click on it, and then I would type in single. Notice sometimes it's a little bit funny, you do have to play around with how you position it. Let me try it there again. Let's see if I knew how to spell. And then right there, the student is able to see the spelling that matches with, with the picture. So that's, that's the easiest way that we find it to annotate. Um, there's many, many different ways that you could annotate. Uh, I know if you have uh, Adobe, an Adobe account, um, like the paid one, it lets you do that. Uh, so through Adobe is another way. Another way I do it is I, um, in my classroom, I do have a Promethean board. So I open up the Promethean Planet, um, pro the Active Inspire program, and I'm able to annotate um, on my computer. So that is a, an option, a, a way that it's easier because you really don't have to install anything else, but just from your Google, uh, from your Google Drive, you open up the document and then open with. I only, I've only, we've only played around with this one. I mean, I haven't tried this one here, but we only do the doc, the doc hub. So again, it will, and then it saves the the work. So once you open it, notice here uh, it's already saved. So. At the end of the lesson, I could send it to the student. Uh, let's see. A uh, Promethean board is, God, these were used back, way back when. Um, you're able to annotate, you're able to write, it's a smart board, just, you know, just, just with a different, uh, a different company, a Promethean board, what I have, is the same as a smart board. Um, would this be the, same as sharing a screen and letting the students use their annotations. Okay, I tried that one time. There is a feature here where I could uh, do a, a whiteboard. And the only problem is that everybody was drawing something or writing something. So 
it was very distracting and it, I, I couldn't, I couldn't um, get it. You know, I, it was just too much. So, so um, it was, it didn't work very well. Uh, does this come with Google Drive? Yes, actually in Google Drive, when you open it, it's one of those default, you know, I, I didn't have to do anything. I just click on the PDF, it opened up, and then where it says open with, it's right there. So, um, so that, that's how it is. Okay, and, and Ms. Fausto saying Dutch Hub is the best to, to annotate. Uh, she used it to homework corrections as well. Yes. Okay. So does that answer the question on how to annotate? And uh, there's a question by Gloria says, is Doc Hub better than Kami annotation? I don't endorse none or anyone, whatever works for you. For us, this one works good. Uh, but I mean, it, it, you would just have to, I guess, whatever you're using now. Uh, and if it works for you and your students, that, that would be good. Uh, let's see, have you used the Zoom whiteboard? Yes, I have used the Zoom whiteboard, but again, it's, our students, if they're using a screen, a small screen, they're going to um, lose, when, when it's time to go back, it, it's going to be very, very difficult. And sometimes they have uh, older phones that they won't be able to easily go back into the main content. So <laughs> it's up to you again. I mean, I haven't used it. I've tried it once. It didn't work. So I don't think I'm going to try it again. The students were a little bit um, frustrated with it. So if I notice that my students get frustrated with it, I tend to stop using that. Okay. Any other questions in regards to screen annotation? Francisco, we, we've yes. got a couple. Um, can you explain share screen? Because that's what you're doing right now. Yes. So the share screen, uh, is everybody able to see the, the, the button that says share screen? I don't know if it's only on my, my end. Okay. So when I do a share screen, I could share my entire desktop, which allows me to go from, for example, right now I'm on the internet. Uh, I'm in my drive and then now I'm back on my PowerPoint. So you're able to see everything I do on my desktop. If I was, um, if you will only select an app or a program, for example, if I only select that I want you only to see uh, my PowerPoint, you would only see my PowerPoint. But if I went live onto the internet, I wouldn't be able to, um, I wouldn't be able to see, or you wouldn't be able to see what I am what I am showing. So, so it, it might be a little bit hard. It might be a little bit hard, um, or not hard, but it might be a little bit more confusing for the student if you are sharing just the program and not your desktop. Now, two things you wanna consider when you are sharing your desktop, okay? Um, it was at one of the webinars and the host was sharing their desktop and on their desktop they had, um, Inappropriate content, so you want to make sure that when you're sharing your desktop, make sure it's nice and clean, that you don't have any uh, documents that show any personal information or registration forms or any pictures that, you know, might be a little compromising. So one way you could do is just on your desktop is you could just put everything in a file or in a flash drive and then have a clean desktop, only what you're presenting, and then, you know, put it back there after the session, but um, that's how you would share. So when you're sharing desktop, as I'm doing now, you're seeing the PowerPoint, but you're seeing everything I have open. So I have the Google Drive, you could see the background of my computer. So that's when you do a shared, um, a shared screen, uh, a shared screen sharing your, your desktop, okay? For me, that is the easiest because I, it's, I don't have to be, Otherwise, I would have to stop sharing the PowerPoint and share the browser. So it's, it's more steps. So I hope that um, answers that question. Okay. Um, can you show us how to use the whiteboard? Yes. So on the whiteboard, you would go into share. Oh, wait a minute. Melinda, I need help. What's up? 
for the whiteboard, I don't see the whiteboard feature here. So, because I know I would do. Uh, we're on a webinar. Oh, that's right. That's only on a meeting. So, right. difference between a webinar and a meeting is on a meeting, you would do the same thing what I did new share. And then right here, where my mouse is at, you would see a screen that says whiteboard. You would click right there, and then it would open up um, essentially a whiteboard. And then your students with their finger, they could um, write something or, you know, whatnot. So, but again, it, it's, it's something that you would only be able to do in your, in your um, Zoom account if you're doing a meeting, not a webinar, okay? So, let's see, can you highlight? So, I can highlight if I am doing screen annotations. So, just like I, let me open the document back up. So, open up the Thought Hub. And then here I do have the functions. I could highlight, and then you could choose the, the highlight color. So for example, oops, I did something else. Okay, so highlight. Okay, so. so it would highlight like that, okay? So, and then you could change there we go. So that would be the highlight. It's going to be more square than your actual just like, you know, highlighter. So you could choose the different color of highlighter. Okay. So I haven't, I don't really use highlighter. I tend to use all the, anything that I type in black. It's, um, you know, easier to, to read. Uh, the feature here, draw freehand. This one here would let you like, for example, Mainly if you have like a stylus, can't even do the F right. So that one's going to be a little bit complicated. So the one that I use is this one here and this one here to highlight. Again, to erase, you have the eraser. So I could select part of what I wrote or even here. There we go. But notice it also erases a little bit of the, of the content. So you do have to... Uh, play around with it a little bit first, okay? Now, in Zoom, I don't know if you guys are able to see, I don't know if this is only a feature that's on a webinar or on a meeting, but you do have this option that says annotate, and you could pretty much do the same thing. Okay, uh, but again, I, I wanna say it's also on, on Zoom, when you do your meeting, you'll see this one here you could annotate on every uh, document. The only thing is it won't save it. So well, you could press it here and save, but it's gonna save as a JPEG, I believe, not the actual PDF. Okay, so uh, any suggestions with sharing video without exceeding bandwidth? So in that case, that's when I noticed that at the beginning I had my video on and then I turned it off and then none of you guys have, um, have your video on so that should not exceed uh, bandwidth that's why also with my students uh, the first time we did go on camera and video the following times it's only me they're only seeing my screen they don't even get to see they might just see my video the first minute or so of class and then i kind of um you know turn turn it off for because of bandwidth issues okay uh have you had have you been making students present no, I haven't been ma making students presenters during class. Uh, at this point, I feel that they're, we're all barely working with Zoom. That might be something. So if anything, I see this as a, oops, as a, um, uh, as a good, good, um, a good practice is that for next year, we're going to start doing a lot more things. So maybe next year, I am going to be uh, able to. So Florence says she's confused about sharing document, sharing desktop and application program. Okay, so Florence, if I want to share a desktop, I'm going to share everything. So right now you're seeing my presentation and my Google uh, Drive open because I'm sharing the screen. But if I were to do a share only the actual program, the student would only be able to see my presentation or whatever I have open. It could be Word, things like that. And if I'm actually on the internet and I'm telling you, okay, this is my Google Drive, this is the document, you're not going to see that because you're only sharing the program, in this case, PowerPoint. 
but I'm over here looking at another screen, but you as a student, you're not seeing that screen because I don't have a shared, uh, I'm not sharing my desktop, I'm only sharing a program. I hope that kind of under, uh, if that kind of explains it a little bit better. Um, uh, Ellen says, many students don't know how to use email. Actually, we kind of started working with email in January for my computer class. So that's why this has been a seamless transition for them. But for a lot of the, uh, especially ESL who don't have an email, uh, we, it's been a, a, a work in progress. So now I've told my team is come when we start school back again in the fall, from day one, we're gonna be teaching students email, how to log in, how to log out, how to check your email you know, to prepare them. I, I, for me personally, I see this as an opportunity where we all want to teach our students from now on um, email communications, things like that, because, you know, this happened, we were not prepared. But we do want to move in that direction where we have our students more digitally connected. So let me, oops, I fix that one. Okay. Breakout rooms, again, it's one of those features where students might get a little bit lost. Um, we tried this last week and <laughs> it took a while for them to realize that they were working in groups. So, and we even tried it at one of our PLCs uh, in our consortium last time. And it was, you know, a bunch of um, instructors, program directors, uh, clerks, everything. And, and even for us, it was a little bit like, okay, what do we do next? So on the bottom of the screen, of your Zoom, you're going to see the option that says breakout rooms. And there, depending how many students, oops, sorry, depending how many students you have, you could break out into two, three, four different rooms. So if I have about 20 students, maybe I'll do four breakout rooms with five students each. Students could be added automatically. The Zoom would do that all for you or you could do it manually, is where you manually will put one student in this room, this student in that room. It does take up more time. Um, I would use the automatic fe automatically feature, then that way, you know, the student gets placed into a room, and all that they're gonna see is it's gonna be a screen. It's gonna be like a chat area, and then they could also turn on their video. This is maybe where if they have video capabilities, I would, have them share their video. That way they're talking, not with the whole class of 20, but only with the group of four. And then you as the main presenter, you could pretty much go into room by room, okay? So when I use this feature of meeting, I think of myself more like a room monitor in a conference where I kind of, well, I mean, no, in that way I have to be in the, in the actual session, but some people kind of monitor from one place to another, making sure everything's okay. I always like to use the example, I'm, it, being a, uh, when you're going from meeting breakout room to breakout room is like kind of Melinda in a conference when she pops into one room, everything's fine. She goes to the next room, everything's fine. She goes to the next room, everything's fine. So you're kind of rotating around, making sure everyone is, everything's going smoothly. So uh, again, it, it can cause confusion. So, you know, maybe as you're working more and more with it, you could, um, play with it. I was going to try it right now, but I don't want to have to lose people. And <laughs> so I'm just kind of letting you know how it is um, that you could do it. I mean, I've only used it twice. Okay. Uh, let's see. A uh, couple questions. All breakout rooms available on all accounts. Uh, they're available in, in, all, in my free account. So it's available. Yes. So uh, can you share a document video in your breakout room? We didn't get to that level of, uh, of, of in-depth with actually sharing a document. We did share a video. We would only activate our, our, own, our own video. So you would have an option in the bottom of your screen that says share video. Um, Okay, folks, we're getting a lot of questions about, yeah. I can't see the share button. Where's the share button? Could you show me the share button? Um, he can't. <laughs> He's showing it to you right now on the slide. Uh, that's the only way we can show it to you right now because we cannot have a Zoom meeting within a Zoom meeting. 
Um, and the minute we try and do that, it's going to kick everybody out and you're all going to be lost to the ethernet as it were. Uh, so he's showing it to you when you, um, when you get a meeting, when you have your own meeting, when you set it up, um, Francisco mentioned having a test, right? So you're going to just create a meeting test, go in, look at all the little buttons and, and, and click on them, maybe have a colleague come in and you guys can play around with it. We are in a webinar right now and a webinar settings are different than a Zoom meeting settings. We can't, we can't show you what's in a meeting because we're in a webinar. Should we have had a meeting instead of a webinar? No, because in a webinar, we have more control. Uh, we can mute everybody and save the bandwidth with the, the audio and the video. Um, so we discussed that, but eh, no, can't do it. <laughs> there were too many of you to do that. So um, we're showing you as much as we can during this presentation. And that's why Francisco is referring to screenshots. I, yes. I, I'm sorry I interrupted, but it was like no, no, we're no. getting all these questions on yeah, the same thing. And I'm like, oh, we can't show that. <laughs> so, okay. I'm going to go to mute now. Okay. No, anytime, Melinda, anytime. Thank you for that. Um, whoops. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Is there a way to record multiple breakout sessions at, that, at the time? I don't know. Because again, we only used it for a breakout session. We only talked. I know there is the record feature, which I am going to uh, talk to in the next slide. So as you could see on the screenshot that I have here, there's the screen uh, share screen and then there's the record and that's where you would press uh, and record this. Uh, what is the best way to show a video or something from YouTube? Can you do this in some way other than the breakout rooms? Okay. So with YouTube, you were able, well, before, you would be able to copy the link and paste it into the chat box, but now you can't because of privacy issues. And as Marjorie was explaining to us earlier, Marjorie Oliveros from, from OTAN, is that many times, you know, these hackers know how to do things that one can only think could happen in a science fiction movie. But if you were to share a YouTube link, a hacker or somebody can actually go into your computer from that link. So in order to prevent that, no more live links. So what would I do? I would type in the link and then I would have the student copy and paste, or I would send it via Remind. I, you know, there has to be a workaround. So to share links from Zoom into a student, uh, no, there's no way. But there are other workarounds. You could text it to the student. You could put it in a document and share that document with a student with a live link. So again, there's different ways of, of, um, of doing that. So uh, again, it's all for security. We don't want our information compromised because again, we're not, most of us are not, I think all of us are, we're not working from a school uh, server. We're working from a home server. And I mean, it's less secure than an actual school, school server. Uh, so again, I did the live of <laughs> a little bit, um, I have it in the wrong place, sorry about that. But to point number four is recording. You don't wanna record anything without your student's consent. Now, at the beginning of the year, we have students when they register and everything, there is a part or at the beginning there is, even it's in our district handbook, where they sign a waiver that allows us to use uh, pictures or video. That was back way back when we were in an actual classroom. So one thing, and we haven't recorded any sessions, but I will start recording, but I will have the students uh, consent. So a way that I thought in my, in my, um, of doing this is asking the student, if you do not want to be recorded or you know, come out on video, press your video to um, not share or to you know, block your video. Um, so that could be a way I'm looking also in our district's policy because again, this is all new. So this is all like from a month to now that we've had to think outside the box and I've emailed our tech director is, can we have our students digitally sign something or digitally acknowledge that we're gonna record this for purposes that not everybody could join the Zoom class at this time. Uh, I'm planning on uploading 
uh, things to YouTube. Those of you who haven't been to Jennifer, Jennifer's YouTube session on how to do this, please find, find it. I know Otan had one yesterday uh, with Jennifer. Uh, and so I'm using a lot of her, her um, tips on how to set up my own YouTube channel. But again, you do want to get the student's permission because as you notice with Zoom, you would see in the pictures that you saw, you saw my picture, you saw my name. So all that's privacy issues. So you do want to get the student's consent. So one way that I'm planning on addressing that next week is asking the students if you don't want to have be recorded, you know, your face come out on video, please unshare your, um, your video or disable your, your video. Okay. Uh, let's see. A question is, if we use Standout that is online, can we put it on Zoom? The thing is with Zoom, you're not putting anything on Zoom. You're just presenting with Zoom. So if you have, for example, Standout, I know Ventures is also online. I'm not endorsing anyone, but it just came up. Um, you could. You could do a share screen. You have it on your screen and you do the share screen, uh, share your desktop, and you will be able to to share that information. Um, yes, and it's also like it says, uh, FYI in California, it's illegal to record people without notifying them and gaining their permission. So that's why I, I'm planning on doing this is if they're not comfortable with me, video, either they could leave the meeting or you know put their video not to show. Um, again, the bandwidth might affect their data plan. If everyone's on video, it's gonna be more bandwidth. And if the person only has like five gigs, it will probably consume it fairly quick. Uh, how do you retrieve video? So with Zoom, if you're recording, it will record onto your desktop and then you could upload it, for example, to a YouTube channel, which is what I'm hearing some agencies are doing. Um, let's see, Julie says, recent articles on Zoom privacy issues say that no recording session is helpful to bring more privacy for users, okay, um, let's see here. So we have a couple more minutes, I wouldn't say about two or three more minutes. Uh, I know, you know, with Zoom, it's, it's, it's a lot to absorb in, in an hour's time. Um, so again, I'm not, ex don't, don't go, when I started using it with my students, I was just using the very basic features like screen share out there, you could see my screen. Um, breakout rooms, I might try with my computer literacy class maybe sometime mid-May. I just don't wanna dump everything and you don't wanna dump everything on them so quick because you wanna play with it first, okay? So it looks like the questions are winding down. Francisco, I have a suggestion. Yes. I'm just playing around with an idea right now. Mm -hmm. um, I just shared a document with you called Zoom Test. It went to your uh, Soldad email. Okay. Okay. Could you open your email and see if you see that share? Okay. Let me see here. I think this is going to answer quite a few questions that came up as far as how do we do that? How do we do that? <laughs> Did okay. it come through? It's coming through. Let me see. Okay. Patience, folks. We're, we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. Yeah, somebody was talking about phone um, and, and um, bandwidth issues. I think my carrier is really... Oh, it's starting to clog down. Well, my phone one. Um, it says, it just says, this is a document. I don't know if that's is what it, you're yes. saying. Can yes. Can you share that? Can you open that up on your computer and share it? Um, let me see if I could. So folks, while he's doing that, what I've done is I've created a document. So let's pretend I'm the teacher right now or the trainer or whatever you want to call me. Or the interloper. <laughs> I've shared a document with Francisco. He's going to open up the document. And I'm on the document right now. I am there. Okay. And he's there too. And, and he, all too? he's going to do, all he's going to do right now is, is well, he's going to type. Hello. <laughs> oh, sorry. So you see him typing, right? 
But now I'm not sharing. I am not sharing. Francisco is sharing in the Zoom. So I'm going to type. Remember, I'm not sharing in Zoom, but I am on the document. Now I'm going to make this bigger because I know some of you can't see that. There we go. So I am typing on the document. Okay, now if Francisco shared that with me and he was showing the document, so he, he went to a meeting, he clicked the share screen button, and this document came up. Now I, as the co-teacher, can type when he tells me to, or he could share this document with his students mm -hmm. and then maybe put a table into it and he would assign everybody a number on the table. So you're row one, you're row two, you're row three. And then he would assign everybody the number and then they could all go to the document to and the type document. two. And then we would all see it together. So I am not typing on the Zoom window. I can't click anything on the Zoom mm -hmm. window. I can't do a thing on the Zoom window, but I can type on a shared document. Okay. So this is, I mean, this is the power of the cloud as well. You're actually sharing yes, a document. On the cloud. Yeah, yeah. So now here's, here's something that's going to blow your mind. I have just closed the document. And I still have it open. Exactly. So he mm -hmm. can still continue the teaching. So how am I able to, how are we both able to speak? Because we both have our microphones on. <laughs> But we're not talking over one another. That was also a question that came up. Can we have all of our students read at the same time? You can. You can. <laughs> but it's going to be back and forth. You're going to, it, it's called video presence. So whoever has the strongest connection or the loudest voice, <laughs> you, that's who you're going to hear. Exactly. And then also take into consideration, you might not just be hearing your students. You might be hearing their television. You might be hearing the dog barking. You might be hearing... Uh, the children having fun or you might be hearing the phone ring you might be hearing the doorbell ring although it shouldn't be ringing right now but you're going to hear all these distractions um, from one person multiply that by let's say 10 15 and then the presenter so it can get a little bit um, hectic so but again the students would be able to control that um, to mute or unmute uh, there a couple questions on the youtube can you show a youtube video during zoom Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because again, you're sharing your screen. So technically, you can uh, do that. I haven't done that. Um, because again, you know, when you open up YouTube, God knows what's going to pop up as an ad. So I kind of don't. I mean, I do send out YouTube links to my students for um, on whatever subject we're talking about or what we're learning in class. So that one would be um, a way that you could do it. Uh, let's see here. Make sure you preview the video first. Yes. And make sure it's not just a random, you know, <laughs> person selling something or an idea. Uh, let's see. It looks like the questions are winding down. So cell phone connections, again, that's a very tricky, um, everybody is on you know, mobile devices right now. So I know bandwidths are really bad. They're slow. So, you know, sometimes students, and I've had that, students disconnect and I have to, when they come back in, I have to uh, make sure I let them back into the classroom. Uh, let's see here. Um, how do I share my desktop? Again, I would go to the button that says share, share screen. And then from share screen, I would do share my desktop. And let's see here. Uh, let's see. Okay. So it looks like we are winding down. Again, thank you very much for, for joining us this afternoon. I hope you get the time to sign up for an account and play with it. Maybe log in, have people in your family log in to your, your Zoom first as a trial and test a lot of the things, uh, things out. Maybe some of you could connect with your 
home internet and other people could connect if they're on a mobile device with their actual um, data plan from their carrier. So you could see that there will be a small delay between your home network and your students uh, or your the other person's uh, phone, depending where you're at again and connectivity problems. So it's always good to test everything out on different devices, on a computer, on a on a, a tablet, on a smartphone. So then that way you are able to experience what your students are experiencing because they're not gonna have all the bells and, bells and whistles that you do. Uh, let's see. So Melinda, uh, there's a question you mentioned about taking role again at the end. Yes, and there was also okay. a question in the Q&A um, about, you know, does everybody uh, have you come in and type in your name and um, agency? Um, we have over 200 people in this room right now. So if you have 200 students, yes, I would definitely suggest that you have them type in their <laughs> names on the, uh, the attending or in the chat. That way you know who's here. So, um, you know, everybody uses Zoom in a different way. If Francisco has given you a different way or a way to use uh, Zoom meeting mm -hmm. in a classroom, we actually use Zoom webinar. So, um, you know, everybody's got their different, different ways of doing things. And you'll find that maybe his way is good up to a point, And then you have to think of something else mm -hmm. to do in a different way. Yeah. So take what you've been given, um, use it, lose it or abuse it in any way you wish and make it yours. One last question that I do want to address is there's an advantage of students having the app, the Zoom app. Uh, yes, because if you send the link to them, via reminder however you send it to them when the student taps on that link it's going to open up in the actual app so they're not going to have to go into the computer type in the address type in the meeting it does it automatically so with students who are on a smartphone they usually connect within a minute students that are on a computer because they're sending me text messages to remind they're like okay what do i do first how do i this came up and now this popped up so I do feel it's good if they have the app. Again, the app, you could, it, it would only work for mobile devices, not for the actual um, uh, computer. Um, 